Good morning and welcome. Happy New Year to you. Uh, please, if you have your Bibles with you, find the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And uh, I think this morning we can stick in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three books of the New Testament. So there'll be opportunities to page throughout those books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Matthew is the first book of the, the New Testament. And so that's where we'll begin here in just a moment. So the last time I uh, preached, I had seven pages of notes. And I have seven pages again, but I have really big font. So I'll, I'll show you. I can show you my seven pages. How's this? Okay, is this good? It better be in order. Malachi Tuck helped me out this morning. So there's my seven pages of notes right there. And uh, those of you, yeah, we'll, we'll zip right through them. Uh, not enough vowels though to put a word together there, is there, Don? So uh, last winter, uh, in spring, Janelle and I got to uh, take a class. It's called Perspectives, Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. And uh, it's a course that's offered in universities and it's offered online and it's held in person uh, well, in many countries around the uh, globe every winter and spring. And uh, one of the, the purposes of that class is to just expose students to God's story and history and what's been happening in our world since the start of the early church, looking at the history of the church and history of evangelism around the world. And then it leads all the way up to what's going on in the current time. And uh, it was a wonderful course. Uh, it begins again on January the 19th, I believe. And uh, if any of you would have any interest in knowing more about it, uh, please see me or look up online perspectives.org. Uh, I know there's a class, classes getting underway at Fairhaven Church and at Patterson Park Church uh, here in just a couple of weeks. Uh, I'll just say to you and, and those of you who know me kind of understand that I, I would just say to you that it's a quality experience. Uh, wonderful lectures that come every week uh, and, and share most of them are either active or retired uh, missionaries. And there's just a little book to read, 700 pages long. It's a collection of articles and stories, and it's really quality too. And uh, if you do it with your spouse, uh, Janelle and I did it together, and uh, it was nice. We did all our quizzes together, wrote our papers, and did our project at the end together. And it was a quality experience. And I, I pulled out that book and I was rereading through some of the articles uh, the last few days. And what I want to talk about this morning is, is a little uh, adaption from one of the articles that a man named George Patterson wrote. And it was an article called The Spontaneous Multiplication of Churches. And George Patterson was a pioneer missionary in Honduras. And uh, a pioneer missionary is someone who goes into a people group where Jesus Christ is not known. And they're the first to go there and to introduce people to Jesus. And can you imagine what that would be like to go to a, another culture, speaking a different language, and being the first to tell them about Jesus? And then where do you begin? What do you do? What do you start with? All of us growing up in our culture, uh, even those that aren't a part of the church, there's still some commonality with what church is about, what religion's about, what God's about, what Jesus is about. There's something there. But when you go to a brand new people group and you're the first to go, what is the things that we, as a, as a pioneer missionary, that needs to be taught to those people? And uh, George Patterson 
in this uh, little article that he wrote, said that the, the starting point is to teach people to obey the commands of Jesus. To teach people to obey the commands of Jesus. And he uh, looked through the Gospels and looked at what was going on, the activities of the early church as described in Acts and throughout the epistles, and came up with seven commands of Jesus that were foundational, primary, for a church. At the very beginnings of a church. So if you can imagine sitting with a group of people and you have God's Word and you've got knowledge in your brain about Jesus and the Gospel and church and heaven and hell and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity and all of this, and you're talking to somebody that knows nothing about that. And uh, to George Patterson's ministry and uh, things that he, he said, here are seven things, seven commands of Jesus that are our starting point. And as we uh, go into this new year, I just thought it would be appropriate to go through those seven with you. And uh, maybe this will uh, bother you, but maybe it will cause your children later to say, what was Pastor Van doing? But we have a little mnemonic device to help us to remember these seven things. Uh, and that's what those seven letters are. And they're down through the side of your notes if you have your notes. But it's really big lassos can pull giant dogs. Really big lassos can pull giant dogs. So we're low budget, but we do have a really big lasso. Is that all right? Do I look like I could be in? Probably not. But this is a really big lasso, all right? And we're still low budget. We don't really have a giant dog, but we do have a dog. All right? And so really big lassos can pull giant dogs. And I really hope that later on your kids say, what was Pastor Ban doing with a lasso and why was their dog up there? And you can go through these seven things with your kids, with your grandkids, with your neighbors, and maybe you can find a rope and uh, swing it around too so that they can be remembering these things. But what is it again? Say it with me. Really big lassos can pull giant dogs. Say it again. Really big lassos can pull giant dogs. Are the letters in the right order? Somebody nod. Okay, Tommy, thank you. All right, really big lassos can pull giant dogs. Got it? I didn't hear it any well. Say it again. Nice. Can you do it without the letters? Some of you can. Some of you are really quick learners. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Here, here we go. Here we go together one more time. Really? Really big lassos can pull giant dogs. All right? The starting point for the church is to obey the commands of Jesus. It's to obey the commands of Jesus. And we're going to look at seven of them, as I've said. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28, the very last chapter of the book of Matthew. We'll go to the very end of that chapter. And perhaps this is a few familiar verses to you. Uh, some of our Bibles here recently have gotten rid of the red letters. Some of you familiar with the red letters in the Bible, right? That, that help us to see the words of Jesus, right? They pop out uh, in my Bible, my text here, it's in red. Matthew 28 and verse 18 says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's our starting point this morning. The followers of God should be about obeying the commands of Jesus and teaching them to other people. The things that you have heard, Jesus says, from me. Teach them to others. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. 
Now, there's a lot more commands from Jesus than seven. Right? There's a lot more than seven. But it's interesting that these seven uh, that George Patterson chose uh, are repeated often in the early church. And we see the early church practicing these things. And so that very next generation or that generation of Jesus, the apostles that were with him, took the commands of Jesus and taught them to others. And little churches were springing up all around Asia, Southern Europe, and North Africa. And what were they doing in these churches? Obeying the commands of Jesus. Uh, when we talk about obedience, uh, just a couple of things here in our introduction yet. Uh, we need to remember that we don't obey Jesus to earn favor or status with God. Okay? We obey Jesus out of love for God. Okay? It's always in love. And if we obey for any other reason, then it becomes legalism. We're trying to gain status or favor with God, and God hates legalism. Another really thing about, about obeying Jesus is that God enables us to obey, obey Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, there's this verse that says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purposes. There's something about God and His Holy Spirit transforms our hearts and transforms our minds so that He enables us to obey the commands of Jesus. So it's not just our efforts and oh, how are we going to do this, but as we love God and follow God, God makes obeying Jesus easier for us. It becomes natural for us. It becomes our nature because it's what? It's our new nature, our resurrected life nature that's in us that starts coming out. The obedience also confirms the sincerity of our beliefs. People say they can believe whatever they want. But how are those beliefs lived out? Right? If our actions don't match up to our beliefs, there's a dissonance there. And so uh, one of the, the speakers that we had in our perspectives class, his name was Brian Hogan. And he was a pioneer missionary to Mongolia. And in the early 90s, as the uh, Soviet Union broke up, he and his wife and uh, three small children uh, were burdened to take the gospel to a nation where there was no known church. It's incredible. Not just a city or not just a, a people group within Mongolia, but within all of Mongolia, there was no known church. And in the early 90s, in the middle of the winter, a lot of people were telling him, it was small children, were telling him, are you sure this is the right time to go? It was a cold winter, and with the fall of, of communism, there was a shortage of food. And would there be heat in the buildings? And there's just countless reasons. And, and Brian Hogan wrote a book. It's called There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. It's another quality little book. Uh, there were at least two sheep in his bathtub in this book. The first were the sheep in Mongolia that they bought at the market and slaughtered in their bathtub. And second was the first believers in Mongolia that he led to Christ that were baptized in this bathtub. Isn't that awesome? But as they were considering, do we go to Mongolia or not, he writes this, to trust God is to go in total faith without any guarantees except His goodness and faithfulness and call. But to follow the dictates of circumstance and prudence over the commands of God would give lie to everything we stood for and hoped to accomplish. If it's really about obeying Jesus, then we have to live that way in obedience to Jesus. So what is a church? Perhaps a very simple and basic 
definition, it's a group of believers in Christ who are dedicated to obeying His commands. So let's go through these seven. We won't take very long with each one. There's uh, several verses that are listed in your notes if you have a copy of those that you are welcome and encouraged to look at later. Really big lassos can pull giant dogs. Is that right? Really big lasso. So here's the R. Repent. Repent and believe. In your Bibles, if you just turn maybe one or two pages to the Mark, book of Mark, chapter 1, and verse 15. Mark 1 and verse 15. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Some of these commands of Jesus are pretty obvious. Right? Maybe as you start reading the Gospels, you'll, these will start popping out more to you just from what we do this morning. But what does Jesus say? Repent and believe the good news. Repent. Repent is that idea of turning from the action of sin. And believing is what's drawing us toward a different action. Repent, we turn our back on the action of sin, whatever that sinful behavior has been in our lives, and we say, no, we want to believe in God and believe that His way of doing things is the right way to do things. In a sense, He becomes Lord of our lives, right? Control of our lives. We submit to Him. He's our Master. So repentance is turning from sin. We confess it. We leave it behind. We understand the immensity of His forgiveness. And we love Him so much that we want to turn from our own sinful desires. Patterson writes, let me just say that again. We understand the immensity of His forgiveness. and We love Him so much that we want to turn away from our own desires. So repentance is, is turning our back away from sin. And believing that God, that His way is a better way. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him. What is that belief about? It's a belief, it's putting a trust that Jesus is the way to go. The way to life. So repent is turning from sin. And believing is Choosing to trust Jesus as Lord. In Acts 3, in the early church, Peter stands up, and in Acts 3.19, he says this, Repent then. Why do you think he said that? Because he had spent time with his Lord, Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus say? Whatever you've heard from me, teach others to obey it. Well, what did he hear from Jesus? Repent. So what did Peter do in his message? He says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the time of refreshing may come from the Lord. There's another sweet account in Luke chapter 7 about a sinful woman who demonstrates repentance and belief. She comes to Jesus and anoints His feet and is weeping. She's broken over her sin. But she knows that Jesus is where she can go to find forgiveness. A loving Savior. And at the end of that passage, Jesus forgives her of her sins. It's a beautiful picture of repentance and belief. Number two, really big lassos can pull giant dogs. B. Got two B's here. Be baptized. Be baptized. Be baptized. Did you ever consider this as a command of Jesus? If you just go back your two pages in your Bible to the end of the book of Matthew, the verses that we read to begin with, Matthew 28. What did Jesus say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What did the early church do? Right in the book of Acts, the first several chapters, over and over again, people believed and were baptized. People believed and were baptized. Why? Because they were obeying the commands of Jesus. What is baptism about? It's we identify Jesus as our Lord and we let people know that He's the one we've chosen to follow. He's the one. In many foreign cultures where the church is persecuted, it's, it's baptism that begins the challenges and the persecution for a follower of Jesus because they're publicly identifying and saying, my allegiance is first to Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6, we read that baptism is also just a beautiful picture of our new life that's in Jesus. You just read Romans chapter 6, these first 11 verses. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase, Paul writes? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What is that picture of baptism? Going down into the water? Death. Laying in the grave. No life, no air, no oxygen. Can't stay there very long. I was desperate for what? For air to breathe. And you come up as Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Come up to a new life. Come up to air, to real life. And it's just that beautiful picture of ourselves dying and being raised like Jesus to a life with Jesus. Continues in that passage in Romans. For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, church, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I don't know, my mind just goes back to that little group of people sitting around one of those pioneer missionaries. Someone repents and believes in Jesus. What do we do next? Well, we'd be baptized. And when they're baptized in a bathtub or in a river or in a lake, what are all the people watching and seeing? Isn't it amazing the imagery and the symbolism that's there? As they ask questions, as kids ask questions, what are these people doing? Dying to themselves coming alive for Jesus. Be baptized. Let her be. Number three, really big lassos can pull giant dogs. L. Love God, love your neighbors. Some of you probably worked ahead of me and figured that one out. We've learned that. We've learned this command of Jesus. Not too long ago as a church, we memorized Matthew 22. If you have your Bibles, flip back just a few chapters to Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Some more red letters of Jesus' words here. Matthew chapter 27, verse 37 says this. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What is the church about? It's a group of people who are obeying Jesus, obeying his commands. What is his command? To love. That's revolutionizing in most cultures. Because that's not our nature. Our nature, it's all about ourselves. It's all about getting ahead and preserving yourself. And Jesus says, no, I have a new commandment for you. It's to love others. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's just part of obeying Jesus is out of love. There's also another pretty special reason why we love. Do you know this? That when we show love to each other, we teach the world about Jesus. It's unusual. It's not ordinary to truly love someone else. It's unusual to lay down your life for another. The usual is the Levite and the priest who walks by the man who's murdered by the side of the road. Because they've got things to do themselves. And they have an agenda, and they have a calendar, and they have to be productive, and they're on to their next thing. But it's unusual for someone to stop and help a neighbor in need. When we love God, when we love neighbors, we're, we're telling the world about Jesus. Teaches the world about Jesus. Love is a sacrifice that puts the needs of others above our own. In John 15, verses 12 and 13, Jesus repeats this again. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Love is sacrifice. Love costs something. Love is valuing your neighbor and trying to introduce them to Jesus. Right? It's their greatest need. Relationship with Jesus. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. He loved us. The command of Jesus is to love God and love your neighbors. Number four, letter C, celebrate communion. Got two C's here again. Celebrate communion. In Luke 22. If you have your Bibles, just flip a few pages to the right. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 22. I think there's a good exercise in turning in our Bibles here in some of these passages because it, like I said earlier, maybe some of these commands of Jesus will start popping out to you again. And what's the church? It's a group of people who believe in Jesus, who are dedicated to obeying His commands. So in Luke 22, maybe we read this too fast sometimes and miss it, but in verse 19, it says this, Luke 22, 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this. See those little command words? Do this. Kids, you ever heard your parents say this? Employees, you ever heard your boss say this? Do this? Well, here's Jesus saying, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In our communion passage that we often look at, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul was addressing some 
issues in the church in Corinth. Because what was one of the practices of the early church? Meeting together and celebrating communion, the Lord's Supper, together. In a few minutes when we do that, why are we doing that? Out of obedience to Jesus. We're obeying His command to do that. When we fail to do these things, we're disobeying Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, words of Paul, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, and the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whenever you do it. Okay? So, repentance and believing in Jesus. If you've taken that step, obedience to Jesus' command says that you need to be baptized. That happens once to declare your allegiance before others that Jesus is your Lord. But what about celebrating communion, our letter C? That's to be done regularly, periodically, as a reminder, out of remembrance of what Jesus has done. So today, we are going to do that out of obedience to Jesus. It reminds us of Jesus' death until He comes. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Number five. Really big lassos can pull. There's our verb. Can pull. Giant dogs. Let's pray. Jesus commands us to pray. If you have your Bibles, go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. More red letters of Jesus, another command of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. Jesus says, And when you pray, He's assuming we're praying. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Three times, but when you pray. But when you pray. But when you pray. Those who are obeying Jesus pray. When do you pray? When do you find a quiet time alone with God to pray? If you aren't, you're not being obedient. You're not being obedient. You're disobeying the command of Jesus. Jesus says, pray. We're so good at trying to manage our lives and manage relationships, and manage people around us, and manage situations. And we live in a culture, and we, we have enough prosperity that we can keep a lot of our lives under control without Jesus messing with any of it. And in God's mercy, you know He does? He upsets our lives. He upsets the world around us. And He says, Pray. He says, pray. Number 
Sam. Sam's back there. I was with Sam yesterday. He was part of our group writing cards and notes for visitation, Sam Gilhood, and he's been talking to his family, and I've been praying a lot for Sophia. I've been praying a lot for Phil and Tara, because their oldest daughter is trying to make some decisions with the family about next year for college. I said, Sam, you've been praying about that? I said, Sam, you got your guys and your boys Bible study praying about that? You're not praying, just, just look around. Maybe your life's okay, and maybe your own life's not going to drive you to prayer. But if you love your neighbor, maybe what's going on in your neighbor's life will drive you to pray. Maybe. Pray for that family. It's breaking up. Pray for that coworker. It's losing a job or has lost their health and can no longer work. When you start writing down a list to pray, there's not enough hours in the day to pray for the needs, and to praise God, and to thank God. And Jesus says to pray. And how do you pray? Well, in those next few verses in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. a lot of little pieces in there to guide your little sections of your prayer life. Praise. Protection. Thanksgiving. Your daily needs. Spiritual protection. It's all there. The church is a group of people who have given their lives to following Jesus and they're dedicated to obeying the commands of Jesus. You look in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, sometime when you have time, a little parable is given of a woman who's persistent in going to an unjust judge over and over again. And finally, that unjust judge gives in to her out of just, I need relief from her nagging. And Jesus closes that with this. He says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And then will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? Yes, He will. Will He keep putting them off? No, He won't. Persistent prayer. Crying out to God. Number six, give. Give. Really big lassos can pull giant dogs. Give. Matthew chapter 6, probably still there in your Bible. Verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Matthew 6 verse 3. But when you give, give to the needy. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When do you give? In the early church, we read in Acts chapter 4 that the early church, it says there, there was no one in the assembly of believers that had a need. Because people were giving. Why were they giving? Because Jesus said, you need to give. You need to be givers. Right? It's just our love in action is, is to give of what you have. And so they sold possessions. They sold their land. They sold their property to provide for those who had need. When do you give? 
when do you give to the work of the church? When do you give of your time and of your resources? Are you known as a generous person with your things? No pressure, Matt Jobson, but our, our recent here property owner in Xenia. Is he going to be a potter or is he going to be a bailey? Come, it's a wonderful life. We're watching, Matt. God's watching. Someone who gives. Who gives generously. Luke 6.38 Jesus' words, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give. We just sometimes slip over these commands too quickly, don't we? Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God will take care of you. He'll take care of you. The church is a group of believers in Christ dedicated to obeying His commands. Do you give? And number seven, disciple others. Disciple others. And this takes us back to where we started in Matthew 28. Disciple others. Matthew 28, verse 18. It's filled with some final words of Jesus. Don't miss these commands. He's saying to his followers. All authority, I've read it now three times, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. Uh, I'm not sure which of these seven commands of Jesus is your challenge, is your weakness, is your disobedience. <laughs> but who are you discipling? Because Jesus commands you to be a discipler. And if you are not discipling anyone actively right now, then maybe you need to go to number one and repent and confess before communion. And if it's been a pattern and a habit of your life that you've not been a discipler of anybody else, maybe communion's not for you. Because Jesus says, go and make disciples. Do we obey it? Or do we disobey it? Whose lives are you building into? Jesus modeled it for his disciples. He modeled it for us in John 4 where he went through Samaria and took time to talk to the woman who was getting water at the well. And what did she do? She ran into the town and told others, come see Jesus. And many in that town believed Jesus. That woman was just immediately a little disciple maker because people who get Jesus are driven to tell other people about Jesus. Who are you discipling? What hours in your week are given to building relationships with unbelievers and with believers who are behind you in the faith? 
What hours in your week are giving to building relationships with unbelievers or with other believers who are behind you in your faith? Yesterday, during our visitation time, one of the ladies we called was Carolyn Hudson. Uh, we had some of the high school girls with us yesterday, and I gave them the phone. I said, why don't you call Carolyn? She'll be excited to hear from you because you're Sarah's disciples. Use that word. Or what? I've never heard that before. No. There's some of our young ladies, our students, who are part of the girls' Bible study, who are being discipled each week by Sarah and Hillary and Jenna Lynn. There's some boys that are being discipled by Drew and Nick. There's some of you that work in Blast that are teaching kids about Jesus and discipling them. There are many of you at home, I hope, who are training up your children to obey the commands of Jesus. If you haven't been discipling your kids intentionally, you need to. And maybe the starting point is really big lassos can pull giant dogs and talk to your kids about repentance and confession and about baptism and about what the Lord's Supper is all about when your kids say, what's that going by? Celebrating communion. Prayer. Pray with your kids. Teach them to pray. Giving. I have to tell this story to others. Some of our kids have more courage than we do as adults in telling others about Jesus. Sometimes it might even be embarrassing to us. So in conclusion, I just want to ask this question. What adjustments are necessary in your life in order for you to obey Jesus in just these seven areas. There's plenty more. But do you need to make any adjustments in your life in order to obey Jesus? In a few moments, we're going to celebrate together communion. And in 1 Corinthians 10, there's a warning. Verse 21, it says this, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. The table that Jesus sets before us is not a table for those who do not want to obey the commands of Jesus. It's light and darkness difference. It's following the Lord or following demons difference. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, it says this, So, whenever, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. I ask David to come up and we're going to have a few moments of, of for you to think. And I'm going to ask Pastor Greg Galen, you're over there. I'll be up here. When you look at those seven things, if you're not obeying those seven basic commands of Jesus, communion's not for you until you do that. It's 
not for you. To make light of the death of Jesus. And if you need to come pray with someone, maybe you need to at your seat turn around and kneel at your seat. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've been disobedient to you. I've not been obeying your command. Please forgive me. Turn from sin, repentance, and believe again that Jesus is Lord and that His way is the right way to go. Maybe you need to come up front and kneel at a step. But we're going to take some time. Look through those seven areas. Are you obeying the commands of Jesus? None of us are worthy of any of our own works, our own efforts. Because it's Jesus' righteousness that we can be declared righteous. And even, <laughs> even think about ever having a meal at the same table with Jesus. God declares us righteous. Jesus died so that we could have forgiveness from sins and a fresh start. And he calls us to a new life. Is that baptism is that right? Called to a new life. And a big part of that life is this church family. And if you're a visitor, it's whatever church family God has you a part of. Because you know what a church family is about? Right? It's a group of people who are followers of Jesus who are dedicated to obeying His commands. That's what it's about. And we get to do that together and we get to help each other out in obeying the commands of Jesus. And if you look at that list and you say, I think I'm a follower of God, but I've never been baptized. So ask someone. I know I'm supposed to pray, but I don't know how to. So ask someone. We're all on this journey of learning, but we get to learn together. 
and help each other out in obeying the commands of Jesus. Jesus says I'm supposed to make disciples, but I don't know where to start. How do I do that? Well, there's people around here that will bring you along, bring you with them, and give you opportunities for you to make disciples. God help us. Now we get to celebrate. Remember what Jesus has done for us to make any of this possible. If you're going to participate in communion this morning, there's a table up here on each side. and You can come up and get that cup and the wafers on the top of it. Please go ahead and come if you're going to participate. If you're living a life of obedience to Jesus and His commands, you're invited to participate. We read in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you came to this earth in the body of a man in flesh the perfect sinless sacrifice for us and that your body was broken and beaten you were rejected used mocked and on display for all to see for us Carefully peel off the top the wafers there. And Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. God, we read that there's life in the blood. Throughout the Old Testament, how was it that the altar that was bloodied became the picture of purification? That because Jesus, we thank you because Jesus came shed his blood let go of his life so that we might have life in a relationship with you oh God thank you thank you for the blood of Jesus this is a new way that we can be in your family our sins can be forgiven we can live victoriously. Amen. Jesus said in the same way, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.